Hello, filmmakers. Uh, welcome to this uh, once again live, trying to figure it out as we go a show. I am with Scott DuPont today, and I'm very happy that he's here because one, you guys are always asking me, how do I get financing for my movie? And two, I discovered his podcast a few weeks ago. It's called um, Finance Your Movie. And I binged it. Like I listened to pretty much every episode for two weeks straight once I found it. So after this, go listen to that. But we have them today and we're going to talk about the five big shifts you must make to finance your indie film. And I'm glad we're here with you today, Scott. I would love to uh, jump right in, but I want to remind filmmakers again that you, those of you are here, questions, put them in the comment box as soon as um, they come up, as soon as we can get to them, we'll answer them. We'll answer all of them before the episode is over. So let's get into it. Scott. Thank you so much, Jen. It's really great to be here. And uh, yeah, I'm going to jump right into the five big shifts that hold almost all indie filmmakers back from getting their independent film financed. Um, I wish I had this information 30 years ago when I started. I developed a system and a lot of this was trial and error, but it works. I've done like two dozen films and raised millions and millions of dollars. But before I jump into these five shifts, let me just disclose what this is not going to be about because I don't want to waste anyone's time. So if you're an indie filmmaker out there and you've got a great project and you want to get into one of the rooms at one of the big SVOD streamers like Netflix or Disney Plus or Hulu and you want to pitch one of the big studios or networks, that's not what I'm going to talk about. Um, I've tr gotten into some of those rooms and I have not successfully had a, a pickup for a five, 10, $20 million film. I haven't even been able to option anything. So this is all about you going out and financing your own movie. Uh, the other caveat before the pandemic, the hard line in the sand that I always drew was about $2 million or more. I had some friends that have done three, five, seven, nine million dollar independent films. A lot of them have been bloodbaths for the investors. Uh, right now, I think it's a safer number, about a million five and under, because post pandemic, not a lot of indie films. In fact, I can count all of them on one hand this year, truly independent that have gone to theatrical. And if you have a million dollars or less, you raise the money yourself. There's a really good chance if you know what you're doing, you get some luck on your side, you can make that back streaming. So if you're trying to raise a million, a million and a half or less, here's the five big shifts that will help you. A lot of these are very counterintuitive, but take some notes if you want, because these absolutely, uh, this, is, this is what I do. Number one, share the bad news up front. What I mean by that is I, I hear so many people pitch projects or they have these really fancy schmancy pitch decks and they're over hyping. They're overselling. Oh, we're going to get this big name star and a half a million dollar budget and we're going to do this and we're going to go to a few festivals and then we're going to, you know, we're going to sell it to Netflix. It's a lot better if you take the approach where you, one of the first things you share is like, look, my name's Scott. I'm an indie filmmaker. I've been doing this for a while. In case you know, you're done with me and you go to Google, you're going to find out that 70 to 90%, depending on which study you look at, of independent films are not going to get finished, financed, or make any movie. So why don't I just tell you that up front? Now, here's why Scott DuPont's a little bit different. And I rattle off, boom, 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 a couple of reasons right? So you obviously have a couple of strategic things about your project that you're excited about. But if you share that up front and say, hey, first of all, I'm not a first time filmmaker. I've been in the business a while. We've got a great team, yada, yada, yada. But by disclosing that bad news up front, you show your true character. And he's like, hey, this guy's being upfront about this. And he gave us a lot of supporting reasons why one, two, three, and four why, hey, this could possibly be a home run. And Scott or whoever you're, you know, whoever you are when you're pitching it, this guy or this girl, they're doing a couple of things to minimize the downsides. Because I see so many people, they don't bring it up in the, in the conversation. 
they're hyping, they're hyping, they're hyping. They're eventually going to get to it in the business plan or the investor agreement anyway. They're going to read that risk disclosure paragraph, which if you're halfway honest and ethical, you have to have that. So why not just share that up front? So that it really reveals your character and it almost takes the pressure off you as the guy pitching your project because it's like, wow, he's not like a hype meister. I'm, I'm going to listen to this guy and I might actually trust this guy. Uh, number two, learn the pitfalls. You could call a pitfall really an obstacle or an objection. Learn the pitfalls, the obstacles and objection that no one talks about. Okay. They don't talk about this in film school. Veteran producers are not going to tell you this because they've been through the battlefield for dozens and dozens of years, but you need to figure out what some of these are. Um, for example, uh, one of the pitfalls, let's say the minimum investment share on your particular project is 10 K. Okay. You're going to be sharing your business plan with a lot of people. You just need to know in advance that liquidity for 10K, if that's the minimum, it's probably going to come up quite a few times. So if you know that in advance and you know kind of a strategy or a workout or a way to bring that up. So, for example, on the 10K thing, what I do a lot of times is like, hey, this is my project. Here's the budget. Um, minimum shares, 10K. If you want to be a, a co-producer, an executive producer, you know, there's a lot more money. You can buy those titles. And I, I can kind of sense by their body language or some of the words, words they say, I'll be listening for them. If I sense that that's coming up right away, I'll say, oh, by the way, don't feel like I need the 10K all up front because we got post-production costs. We got marketing costs, this whole process of making the film, getting it to distribution sometimes can take six, nine months minimum. So if you're a little bit tight for cash right now on your cash flow, I can break that 10K up into two or three payments to make it easier for you. And I can even do that on a credit card. So that's that's an example of what I mean is you need to learn in advance what some of these pitfalls, obstacles are that people will bring up. Number three, this is a big one. I call this the secret weapon. And you need to break this rule. This is the number one rule they teach at almost every film school in the country. And I know this because I talk at a lot of film schools. The number one rule they teach at film schools is don't use your own money to make your own film. Now, the reason people at film school say this, they know you probably have a ton of uh, student loan debt getting out of school. They know how risky an independent film can be, especially if you're just out of film school. You haven't, this is your first feature. There's a reason for that, right? But once again, counterintuitive. One of the objections, what I just, 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 I just talked about in number two, the first or second objection you will get from almost every investor is this question. I get it all the time. Scott, how much skin do you have in the game? Scott, how much of your own money have you put into this ABC project that you're sharing with me? Okay. Now it doesn't really work. Well, I spent six months writing this script. It's like, oh, well, I've been attached to this for two years. You're not listening to the potential investor and you're not answering their specific question, which is, how much money have you put in? Okay. Now, granted, a lot of indie fil filmmakers, even myself, from time to time, we're going up, down, up, down. I don't always have ten, twenty thousand dollars of seed money to put in development. But if I don't, if I'm really, really tight, I'll throw two thousand dollars on a credit card to pay some legal fees. Okay, that are legitimate development expenses, or if I want to get a property, I don't have the script rights, I'll, I'll you know, put $1,500 on an option on a credit card, just a short-term option. Um, a recent project we did, both myself and my director, producer partner, we didn't have any money to put in, but his son put in the first $25,000, okay? So however you want to address this issue, when that question comes up, 
So Scott, how much money do you have in this film? I'll be able to give them a very specific answer. It's like, well, I put the first $1,500 in legal fees, or I was able to put $5,000 in myself, or, you know, our director's son put in 25 K answering that question that you or one of your team members, one of your producing partners actually put in the first money. It's another kind of like the bad news up front. It's another like, ah, you, you can sense it in the potentialist investors uh, body language. If you're on a zoom or if you're on a face-to-face -face meeting, you can hear it in their voice. If you're on the phone, they're like, Oh, that's good because they know what, what's really, really pathetic is when you refuse to put even a thousand bucks into your own film. This is your passion project. None of your other producing partners put in any money. None of your friends or family members have put in a penny, but you're going to go to some stranger and you want them to invest 10000 or $50,000? It doesn't pass the smell test. Uh, number four the shortcut. So a lot of people, they get so hung up chasing what I call the big kahunas, the big multi-million dollar whales, the big billionaires. And a lot of those people, unless you know those people, they've already got people in their circle of influence. Uh, for example, Larry Ellison, obviously is probably going to take a look at Megan Ellison's film before she takes a look at uh, my film because I don't know who Larry Ellison is and Megan is Larry's daughter. So the shortcut is you don't prejudge anybody. And I mean anybody, unless my sister right now is handling the finance for my 90 year old mother and she doesn't have a lot of money. She's on a fixed income. That's a whole other sidebar. We don't need to talk about, but I'm not going to share my business plan with my mother on my next project because my sister and I have her checkbook. She's not a potential investor, but there are so many crazy, unique life circumstances that happen. Every single one of my films, swear to God, I get one of these five things. I get a lottery winner. I get somebody who just collected a big inheritance. I got somebody that was on the right side of a lawsuit. Um, I'll get somebody who maybe themselves or their family member just sold a big piece of property or a business. So things in life happen. You have no idea what their financial situation is. So the shortcut is you stop prejudging and you also you change the whole approach of a big pitch and you're like, you're getting ready for this big, you know, uh, trying to catch this big whale. You just get a killer, killer business plan and you're sharing it in a non-threatening, really like, hey, you want to take a look at this? This is a really exciting movie. I'd love to talk to you about it. Like it, you're almost like just minimizing the hype factor and you're getting it out to many, many more people and you never, ever wait for anybody even if they say, hey, we'll get back to you next week, you don't stop sharing your business plan until the first check, the next check start coming in because you wait, you could lose 30 days. If you prejudge, you're going to be missing 10, 20 people in front of you who could easily write a $50,000, $100,000 check for your next movie. Um, the big shift number five is get a mentor. Bring on an experienced producer, somebody to your team where there's a hole that's missing, and that is the shortcut to getting your money. So let me give you a very specific story. My very first movie, independent movie, that I was raising money for is just over a million dollars. I had not done a single feature film. Uh, my director writer, writing partner, had never done a feature film. It's actually crazy what we were trying to do in 1998. But the shortcut that we did, what I'm advising you to, we needed somebody that had some gray hairs, meaning somebody that had lots and lots of experience. So I was living in Orlando, Florida at the time. We paid this guy named Tracy Frankel to come on board as our supervising producer, paid him a small amount of money. Doesn't take a lot of money to get somebody 
attached if they're really excited about their project and they can be part of it. So in our business plan, it wasn't just Scott who had acted in a bunch of movies. I'd done a few shorts. Our director who had done several shorts and he really, really had talent. We had this guy, Tracy Frankel, in our business plan that had produced lots of movies. He had gotten distribution for his movies and he had made money with his movies. That's what I'm talking about. The mentor, the veteran producer, get somebody on your team that you can list. And that's the shortcut to getting your money. So I'm going to shut up now. Those are really the five big shifts. And I would love it uh, if you, Jen, or anyone else has any questions. Um, We're definitely going to do questions. And those yeah. of you who have just joined, uh, don't worry. This will live online and you can go back and get all five uh, that he just talked about. And we got a lot in in 15 minutes, which is fantastic. I want to um, stick on number five really quick with this, get a mentor, because I think that sometimes people get stuck on this because it's hard to know in this business who's for real and who's not for real. Do you have suggestions on people for people on when they are deciding to bring somebody on, especially if they're going to pay them what they should be looking for? Yeah, hundred percent. In fact, I was, I was doing that this morning, right before I hopped on um, this, this um, show with you today. Um, a client of mine saying, Hey, cause not all of my clients have the full package. Sometimes I got to say, hey, let's look for a, a better director for a $750,000 budget. You're not really ready. You haven't directed a feature. Let's get somebody or let's get another producer to add into the mix. And a couple of these people that my client was sharing with me, they didn't have an IMDb link. They had a really fancy schmancy bio. They had like a sizzle reel. IMDb, it, it's not 100%, but it's a pretty good indicator. In fact, a lot of things on my IMDb, they aren't even listed there. Like it's just kind of a sample of what I've done for whatever reason, not all the projects are there. But if you can't find somebody that's done several feature film, not shorts, not music videos, it's done several feature films, hopefully in the budget range you're talking about, that person may not be the best person to be added value to your team. Um, if you want to reach out, there are other people that have raised a lot of money for features. If you want to talk to someone else, like I'm not the only guy in town, that's great. Like, I, like I'm not the only show, but I would ask that person, how much money have they raised for how many projects? Because every once in a while, you'll get some guy or some girl that did a feature, but it turns out when the curtains pulled back that it was a micro budget and she only raised $35,000 in hard cash. Now, I'm not saying you can't make a movie for that. You can get very, very creative, but it's better if you work with somebody that's raised a million and a half dollars cash or someone that just did a half million dollar film. So find out whatever component on your team that you're missing and make sure that person has those skills and check the IMDb. And filmmakers on top of that, always trust your gut. If there's something in your gut saying there's a red flag or this person isn't right, I don't care how small the feeling is. You have to trust it. And you don't even have to burn the bridge. Just go your other, go another way with that. Um, and sometimes somebody's great, but they're not great for that particular project as well. So there's a lot of factors. Agree 100%. Um, I love this. There's all questions are rolling in. We'll start with John who asks, when asked how much money you invest in your own film, I think we're talking about number three uh, in the big shifts. How can you translate hours spent working in a monetary amount? So if you, you've invested 80 hours of work into a project, can you tell a potential investor that you've put a couple thousand based on your physical work you've already done? No, that and, and that's where a lot of my friends, a lot of indie filmmakers get stuck because you're asking someone else to put in hard cash. We, are, we already know that this is a passion project for you. So you should be eating, sleeping, and drinking this movie for years before you get the business plan finished, right? And it's there's something different when you say, hey, you know, I don't have any money. Like my partner and I, we've been putting years in this, but my partner's son, he put up 
the first $25,000 investment. Or like I said, hey, I don't have a lot of money right now, but I put $1,500 in my credit card. Another time, I didn't have, you know, my thing's up and down. I mean, sometimes I put $50,000 in my projects. Sometimes I just don't have the money. Even when I don't have the money, I will, uh, one time I brought my brother in and I said, hey, I did, great question, by the way. And I've been working on this thing like 80 hours a week, but I know that's not what you want to hear. But my brother, since I didn't have cash, he put in the first $5,000. So we have cash in. I love that. Uh, John, uh, another John asks, I got a question. How do you approach people with money to invest in your film in this environment, especially when residuals from streaming as well as poor box office returns for indie films? And they can see that they're basically throwing their money away. Well, there's a, there's a couple things to that. Um, first of all, before you even approach anyone, you have to have a bulletproof mindset that, hey, with my particular film, we, we, we know there's risk. Hopefully everybody on this program, you're taking the time and I applaud you for taking your time. You're honest, you're ethical, you're here to learn. Um, you need to have the mindset, yeah, you know there's risk. You're disclosing it up front. You're sharing the bad news, but you also know in your heart that you could have the next Blair Witch Project. I was in Orlando, Florida with those five kids from the University of Central Florida. I was just on the outskirts of that. I've had three really good friends this year that had movies that went theatrical, like micro budgets. So miracles happen every single year. So I don't really think to anybody when I'm approaching that they're throwing their money away. I think, hey, I've got some things in place in my business plan to minimize the risk. My budgets are very, very conservative. That's why I don't go up to $2 million anymore. And there's a shot that my next movie could go gangbusters. Another great thing, I have one movie. I'm not in my main office uh, today, but usually on my uh, office wall behind me in Hollywood, I have films that are about 20 years old that are still generating revenues for me to this day. So that's kind of an exciting thing. Um, and then I think the first part of your question is like, how do you find investors? Once you have a business plan that's killer, and I mean, this thing has to be killer. Even if you have to bring an export on board to help you with this business plan, this is like your business card. It's got to be perfect. I don't make a big deal about it. I just talk to anybody and everybody when I'm out and about. I call people up and say, hey, Scott, what's going on? It's like, well, I'm getting ready to do this really, really cool project. It's a documentary that literally we think will change the world within two years. That's like the log line. And then I go, really? Yeah, I'd love to share a business plan with you. So whatever your, your log line, whatever your excitement is that you're sharing with people, you just want to get as many business plans out as possible. And we're in this day and age where you can just email them a PDF. It's really easy. I, I know that one as from someone who listens to Scott's financial movie podcast, there's the running theme of like everybody and their brother and their mother needs to know about your project and how excited you are for your project and passionate about your project. Because as he said, I think it was number uh, I can merge number four, I think don't prejudge. And there was this one where it's don't prejudge basically. Like you can't judge who might be the next person who invests in your movie. Um, and it's not about going and asking everybody for money. It's, it's more about sharing this awesome project you're doing and getting them excited about it. And that shift for me is what my brain needs because I am somebody who does not like asking for help as it is, especially when it comes to money. So shifting to like my excitement to share a project has absolutely changed everything. Let, let me drill down just for a second on that because this is so, so important to filmmakers that are kind of stuck. And I call this uh, the Blair Witch effect. I was right on the fringes. I auditioned uh, twice to be in that movie, one of the three kids. Uh, Greg Hale is one of my best friends. He's, he's one of the producers. I, it's an obscene amount of money that they all made and, and they deserve it. Lightning struck them. Now, a lot of people might not know that 
And I, by the way, I was offered to be an investor for $500 in that film. And I almost invested. I was like, you know, this is like 1998 in Orlando, Florida. It's like, you know, I can probably still pay rent, but no, nah, I'm going to hang on to that 500 bucks. I didn't invest. So I have no regrets. Now, once that film eclipsed $100 million in theatrical, the lawsuits started coming out of the woodwork. Okay. And one of the lawsuits was one of the friends of those five uh, guys that went to film school with them. And apparently like I, I contributed to part of the script or whatever, a couple other people that sued. What I heard is that they were jealous, they were angry, and they were upset that these five kids didn't share the business plan with their close circle of friends. Another friend of mine saw my movie, um, Movie Money Confidential on American Airlines last month, sent me a really, really nasty text. Because I always include everybody and anybody when I'm doing a film. It's like, oh, Mr. Big Shot, I see your movies on American Airlines. I hope you're making lots of money. Thanks for not including me. So I love you have the opposite of problem. <laughs> like people are mad that you didn't ask them for money. <laughs> well, when when things start making hundreds of millions of dollars, that's the time you get sued. Now, one one more kind of layer to that. A lot of people, well, I don't want to talk to my sister-in-law because if she loses all of her money, God, like Thanksgiving and Christmas dinner is going to be really, really awkward. Okay. So what you just said, Jen, your point is not to try to get your closest family members, your closest friends to invest. Your point is if you don't share with your sister-in-law or your next door neighbor, who's a multi, multi gazillionaire, Okay. And other people in your neighborhood trying to, well, did you talk to Bob yet? The billionaire? Oh no, I didn't talk to him. Right. Then it's going to look like, oh, well, you're not talking to Bob. So if you share with everybody, you're not going to have any problems. And eventually people are going to talk. It's like, yeah, Scott talked to me. I just didn't have the money. And then someone else might come on and invest. I think you've also had those stories where you've talked to somebody who didn't have the money, but they've given you, they're like, oh, but so-and-so can to totally be into this. So you just don't know. Yeah. And that, that usually doesn't happen till the end. Um, you're for, almost like a crowdfunding campaign, you know, Kickstarter, Indiegogo, the most, and we've all seen them. You're like, oh my God, how did those guys like raise $50,000 in a month from donations? Well, one of the reasons they raise $50,000 in a month or two is they know who their five, 10, 50, $500 donors are when they launch the project. And they have this momentum right out of the gate. You need to do the same thing with an equity investment. You need to know your brother, your friend, somebody that you know, it's probably not going to be a couple of complete strangers who don't even know who you are that put in $10,000, $50,000, $100,000. Doesn't usually work out that way. Now, what you just said, Jen, towards the very, very end, that's when sometimes you can get complete strangers. So, in my case, uh, Movie Money Confidential, that documentary I just mentioned, the very, very end, I was only looking for two or three more investors. I talked to everybody, right? I talked to this guy named Bobby Biddle, who I went to summer camp with like 40 plus years ago. Bob, we're just catching up on the phone. It's like, hey, what's going on? It's like, well, I'm doing this really cool movie. Can I send you a business plan? Send him the business plan. Oh my God, this is really cool. And then the next week, he sends in, like, think of like a $5,000 check or whatever. He goes, hey, my business partner, this would be really fun. I want to bring him involved. Is that okay? It's like, okay, I've got like two more shares left. And he brought his business partner in. I didn't even know who this guy was. He signed the paperwork, of course. But that usually happens at the end because of all this momentum. For sure. Uh, we've got time for a few more questions. Well, not really, but we're going to do them anyway. Uh, <laughs> so uh, let's uh, I'll, let's touch base on this. So Real Film Media, getting someone reputable on board is good. I, this was talking about uh, step number five, get a mentor. But I think it's harder for people of color, especially women in indie filmmaking, to get money for their counterparts. And I will say women in general are way underfunded, um, way more than men and women of color worse. Uh, 
I think that the goal there is when it comes to finding a mentor is getting somebody who believes in you. And I, I always say this, especially to white dudes. I'm like, white dudes in power, you have to make the change. So you are the one who has to finance my movie. You're the one who has to open the door to be directing TV shows, whatever it is. So real film media, part of that is looking for mentors that one, people who believe in you, who are people in power with money, but also women of color who are out there doing things. If you can connect with them and get them to start introducing you to their, your, their networks, like a producer's guild, like I could walk into a producer guild event and I see people of all ages and colors and everything. So start to find people who are your people. That way they can help you connect as you move along, but make genuine connections. Don't try to like talk to people for money, like make genuine connections, people who actually want to mentor you and help you out. It's not the big miss. It's, it's not a big piece. It's not easy to do, but it's the one thing I can offer that I know works. Um, Scott, I don't know if you have any other thoughts on the mentoring. Um, well, to answer that specific question, I don't really have an answer to that because I'm an older white dude, but Louise Levinson, I was on a panel with her and somebody asked that question and she's been in the business like, I mean, God, her book first came out, Filmmakers and Financing, I think like 35 years ago. I mean, she knows. And she admitted, she goes, yes, it is harder for a woman in this industry. And yes, it is harder for people, minorities of colors. And what she said, I think is great advice. Just be the best you can be. So they can't poke holes in your producing resume or your body of work. And then like we were talking about at the beginning, build out your team with some extra gray hairs or whatever, and then you should be set. Yeah. And that business plan where you mentioned it needs to be killer. It's really about being undeniable. Like if there's a point where you're just, you know, that it's perfect and you're being denied I almost want to say, call them out. <laughs> you got to call people out. It's not, I, I would love to have a real film media. I would love to actually do a panel on this topic. So you should email info at blackmagiccollective.com and let's talk about how we can do a round table to dive into that more. Um, what do we have next? Uh, per performance, artistic productions. What do you think are essential topics, elements in a business plan? Um, so a couple of the things that I always include in my business plan, um, sometimes you include a mission statement. You should have a mission statement irregardless whether or not you can fit it in your plan or not. And a lot of people say, oh, well, that's only for big businesses or that's only for these corporate. No, if you're doing a film, you should absolutely, and it might take a couple of days with your team, but that's really, really important. Um, then you want to have the log line and the synopsis because I never ever let investors read a script. Okay. The only thing they're looking at is a log line and a synopsis. And that's got to be clear, concise, just attention grabbing. Then after that, I have the team members. It's going to be your, um, uh, by the way, log line synopsis that also applies to a feature length documentary. Obviously there's no script, but you know what the outline, you know what the structure is going to be. So uh, narrative or documentary logline synopsis. That's kind of your story. Uh, the team that's going to be your writer, director, producers, really, you don't really, unless you have like an Emmy award or an Oscar award winning DP that you have a connection to, or an Academy award winning composer, you don't really need like too many crew members, like, you know, makeup artist, costumer, wardrobe, all that stuff, not, not to diminish those departments, but they're really looking for the keys. Um, here's kind of like a stumbling block. I see a lot of people fail is they put the cast, the cast wish list, and they put like Ryan Gosling, or, you know, we're going to bring someone in like Brad Pitt or Liam Hendworth or, or, you know, um, you know, just, just nonsense. They're probably not going to get an A-list actor on a $200,000 budget. Okay. And then if you have these, you know, these A-list Academy Award actors in your business plan, like these are the types of actors we're trying to, to get. And you end up with some TV actor from the 1990s and you're on set explaining to your investors, well, this guy had a show on 
the CW network for six seasons. Like, well, I still don't know who he is. Like, it's just a disaster. Um, I also don't like putting in things like, oh, here's like, here's the projected revenue, right? That to me, that's a lawsuit waiting to happen. I do a comparables table. So if I'm doing a, um, let's say a half million dollar raise on a documentary film, I want to look for other documentaries from a hundred thousand to a million dollars that have done really well, that have generated their budget back, some that have made millions, some made tens, tens of millions. So they at least see that if you hit gold, if everything works perfectly, this half million dollar documentary we're doing could make two million, five million, ten million dollars. Um, then your last page, oh, oh, another important page you want to have. And a lot of people, they're either making this too confusing or they're just missing this altogether. There should be either a table or a pie chart that shows with a paragraph explaining if I put $10,000 in or whatever your minimum amount is, what does that get me? So on one of my business plans, the minimum was $5,000. There's a paragraph that says, if you invest $5,000 and it shows a little pie chart, you have one gross ownership point of all revenues of this film in perpetuity. So they know exactly what they're buying, okay? And then it also shows the money flow, how that comes in. And of course, the last page should be all your contact information, your email address, your phone number for the main producer who's ever sharing the business plan. Um, and then if you have an entertainment attorney attached, which is always a good idea, have his or her name at the bottom. No one ever calls your entertainment attorney, but it just gives this warm, fuzzy feeling like, hey, these guys know what they're doing. Um, I want to ask you on the cast page. So do you list characters at all or you just avoid? If, if it's a character driven piece, I will list the characters. Um, but I don't put pictures of big A-list stars. I don't portray, we're going to put this type of thing. Now, if I have relationships or people I've worked with in the past, I will put a paragraph, hey, Scott has worked with these people in the past. Um, we are going to try to get name talent. And I'll be very, very specific what that name talent is. On, on one of my projects, I literally defined it as somebody who had an Oscar, somebody who had at least um, one or two Emmys and been nominated for an Oscar, someone who was considered A-list, someone who's opened a picture with over a hundred million dollars. So it's very specifically outlined, but normally I don't put that pressure on me. And here's kind of another thing that I do that every other filmmaker seems to do backwards because investors are going to know. So you weren't really specific on what actor you have attached yet. That's what they say to me. I go, yeah, you're right. Because if I start reaching out, and I know a lot of the agents and managers in Hollywood. If I start reaching out to people today and I can't answer the very specific three questions that I get asked every single time I'm trying to get a talent at, they're going to hang the phone up at me. I'm like, oh my God, Scott, what are those three questions? And I'll tell them. Number one, do you have POF, proof of funds? Number two, Scott, what is your SAG bond ID number? Number three, Scott, do you have the exact shooting schedule and what is the window you want my client Danny Trejo for, right? So if you can't answer those three questions, it's a clown show, okay? And you're competing right now, you're competing against Netflix, HBO Max, Disney, it's not just other movies. You're competing against all the other streamers that are throwing money at these people. So my strategy is I have kind of a, a definition of what type of actor I want to get. And I explain, sharing the bad news up front to my investors, here's what I'm going to do. Once we get half a million dollars in the bank, I have a list of about 30 different agents I'm going to call up. Okay, we're going to make Danny Trejo a low ball offer. We're not going to insult 
his agent, we might pay him $5,000 a day, even though he gets a lot more from the studios. And we're going to bring him in for four days. And I'm going to answer those three questions with confidence. And if Danny Treo's in LA, I'll know whether he's in LA or Canada when I call him, we will get Danny Trejo because Danny Trejo loves to act. I love this. I feel like we could do a whole like week workshop learning from you. Uh, for those of you who are asking questions about things like um, there was, a, you know, like, is there an example, good business plan we could reference and such. I know Scott works with people. Uh, if you go to financialmovie.com, you can actually see about hiring his team to help you in different aspects of what you do or what you need done. Um, I don't, uh, and then like John asks, what do you think about WeFunder? I think crowdfunding in general, uh, we could talk about that briefly. I will say now that Seed and Spark doesn't charge filmmakers, I would push you towards Seed and Spark for fundraising on for films. Um, Scott, have you ever done any crowdfunding? I have not yet, but three of my friends, good friends, have used WeFunder, which is crowd equity funding. And typically, here, here's what I've gathered, because I have not done it yet. I am probably will on one of my future films. If you're doing a million dollar or high, like say between 1.1 1. 1 million and say one and a half million, if it's on the high side, just on the high side of a million, I think WeFunder makes a lot of sense because you can reach out to a lot more people. And when you get to the million dollar mark in straight equity cash, it's a higher minimum. And it's going to be tough. It's it's tough right now to raise a million dollars. So in that application, WeFunder definitely could make sense. Um, somebody else asked about the business plan. If you just want the business plan alone, there's a great lady that I would recommend you consider talking to. Her name is Louise Levinson. She actually wrote the book called Filmmakers and Financing. And um, she's really, really good. And she actually has a newsletter that you can get for free, full of information. Oh, nice. um, and I believe it's at moviemoney.com. You can find her newsletter there. That's great. Um, we are so definitely out of time. Everybody, thank you. We're getting, lo getting lots of comments. Thanks, Kate says, thanks so much for all the specific information. Really appreciate it. Uh, John says, this was gold, Scott. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for asking intelligent questions that uh, deepen the conversation. You are going to get a lot more, though, if you go to Financial Movie, uh, the podcast. I'm telling you, binge it. You will learn. You will get all. You get so much more. You'll just just keep. Also, a lot of the stuff we talked about will just continue to be ingrained in you until it clicks. So, um, feel free to reach out to Scott. Of course, always um, go into our Facebook group, Working Director or Black Magic Collective, to keep the conversation going. And uh, I guess that's it for now. Thank you, Scott. Oh, thank you, Jim.